We lived as best we could afford. We had food to eat and things to wear, and no one could imagine what we had to go through. And we still don't know how much more we will have to suffer. Be careful. Watch your step. Yeah, step over it. Yeah, well done. Come on, grandson. Come on, Tomich. See how the cow is eating nicely. Come on, reach out your hand. See? <laughs> I am in charge of Naparivsky farm, which is located in the village of Lukashivka, Chernihiv district. We used to have 1500 plus hectares of land and 316 cattle before the war. The farm was growing fast, a lot of construction was going on. We constructed a grain drying complex before the Russian invasion. The first news about the war came on 24th of February. It was late winter, early in the morning. My son called. It was half past five. So my wife and I took off. They said the war has started. We live not far from the border, 50 kilometers from Belarusian border and 80 kilometers from the Russian border. That very evening, the shelling of Chernihiv started. The hostilities began. Then the district authorities called me. They asked me for a truck to deliver ammunition to the line of defense where our military forces were getting ready to fight the enemy. Right now we are in our company's workshop. We helped the military to repair military equipment, components, assemblies, and whatever else was needed. But despite the hostilities, we did not stop doing our job. We took care of the animals. We milked them, fed them, and started to hand out the milk we produced to the people from nearby villages. We also donated large quantities of potatoes to orphanages, nursing homes and hospitals. Okay, I'm gonna milk that cow, remembering my old times, my younger years. I didn't have my walking cane back in the days, but I gotta use it now. Hey, white legs, your owner is on her way. Oh, that's my smart girl, my sweet beauty. I couldn't believe that this peaceful and friendly come to kill each other. Why? What did we do to them? 
What in the world are they doing? And when they started bombing Chernihiv, I believe that, yeah. I've been living in this village for more than 30 years. When Russian troops entered Lukashivka, I was in my cellar. The shelling was so strong, so terrible. The bullets came flying through the ale, so scary. There is so much I had to go through. When I finally came out in the afternoon, the house was full of smoke and that site was on fire. I just know that the cats tried to escape, so I started breaking windows. That's how mind-numbing it really was. I started hitting the windows, and it didn't help because they were plastic. So I finally broke them and started calling the cats, but black smoke was all over the place. I couldn't save them. Both cats ended up being killed by fire. I stayed near the military all the time. They warned me, sir, you need to get out. These beasts have reached Lukashivka. We are not going to hold it village. At 8 or 9 a.m. March 9th, these beasts entered our village. My wife and I quickly got in our car and left using the last road that was safe. It was like a road of life, a dirt road across the meadow. If I hadn't left, I wouldn't be talking to you now. They wouldn't have let me leave. People left everything they bought and earned through hard work. They left it behind to survive. Kharkiv, Sumy, Bucha, Izum, Kyiv, Mikulayev. There are no scales to measure the weight of this war. Death, hunger, cold, blood, weeping, moaning, bowling, screaming, tears, fear, all contained in one word, war. We had a community youth center here. We had a big screen over there that covered the entire wall. We watch movies here. Young people used to gather here every weekend. We had a bunch of nice couches that we made ourselves and a huge round table beside the panoramic window. One night, on March 11th, three months after it was opened, it was hit by a missile. Our hub was shattered into pieces. When we came, we couldn't even believe what happened. They call it an old folks' home. We have people who are completely alone and unable to take care of themselves. We have younger people too, but they have been disabled since childhood. Good evening, miss. Good evening. You seem to be cold, yeah? Oh, yeah. I brought you another blanket. We're not sure when the power will be back. But as soon as it's on, it's gonna get warmer. I see you keep hiding your back. I do. It's freezing. 
On 28th of February, around 4.15 p.m., Russian soldiers showed up at our center. That was the moment we realized that Russian troops had entered the village. It was heartful to even see them walk on our land, as if it was theirs. They would open the door and shout, show me your ID, in Russian. When I saw there were so many of them, I couldn't help crying. I was just helpless. I couldn't do anything about it. I just couldn't. My God, what if they break in? How can I protect these people? The first couple of days we didn't tell them anything. They realized something was wrong when we started covering the windows with mattresses. And they went. I mean, they figured it out. Why did you do it? Open it! So we started explaining what happened. We told them that a war had broken out and armed Russian soldiers had come here. Many of them didn't believe us. They had rows of Russian weaponry over here, beneath those pine trees. And right under this fear tree, they had a vehicle that jammed our cellular signal. They had that specialized vehicle hidden under the fear tree. Our village is like a recreation park for tanks and orcs. These guys told us, don't be afraid of us. When Chechens come, you'll see what we mean. I don't care. All of them are monsters. Perimoha was fully occupied. We had no power for a long time. We had no natural gas. I was just worried that if they cut off central heating, that's it. We had people in diapers lying in beds. They're wet and they need their clothes changed and washed. If there's no way to do this, they won't die of hunger. They'll just die of cold. People started to get going and move to other villages. They even walked, but they were shot. A convoy of people was shot in the field. My laundry lady was there with her family. They died that day. Tanya, Peter, a 15-year-old boy and 18-year-old kid. They didn't let us get the bodies from the field. My soul is crying out as I write. Why? Who's gonna pick up the bodies that lie all over the place like wits, while we are waiting every second for them to be back, waiting for any news? But there is no news, and there never will be. Russian beasts can only fight women, children and animals. I witnessed it at my own farm, where they fought against our cows. They just shot them. During the hostilities, 158 cattle were killed. And sadly, those were the best. More than a hundred dairy cows were killed. Their corpses were lying all over the place, and most of the cattle just walk around these corpses. Good girl. There you go. Easy, pretty one. Don't be scared. Life under occupation was extremely difficult for cows. They had nothing to eat. They ate anything they could find. The shelling was intense, huge, and they feared everything. They hide wherever they could. The shelling is terrible. And there is this small, frail lady, a milkmaid, is walking to her work to milk the cows. Well, here we are. We had calves here, and we used to milk cows over there.
They hadn't been milked for 24 hours. I could hear them calling. Hungry calves were crying out too. I just got out of the barn, traveled a little distance. And I fell, and I saw a cloud of black smoke coming out of the barn. I immediately began checking myself. I moved my head. Seems okay. Shook it like that. One leg was fine, but the other one was numb. When the city was besieged, ambulances couldn't get through. We transported the wounded. First, we drove an SUV to the city through the pedestrian bridge. We rearranged the seats so three people could fit in. This is the road of life. It runs through a field. We had an agreement with the military, so after artillery stopped firing, we knew we had two or three hours to drive through. And we used these time slots. You don't need a lot of money to become a volunteer, right? You just gotta do it. You gotta help somehow. It so happened that we had an empty seat in our SUV. I went to the hospital and said, is there anyone up to evac? They said, yeah, there is a cheerful old lady, you can meet her over there. I entered the ward and saw Lyubov Mironovna. She wore that red sweater. Slavik, the volunteer, showed up that night. A handsome, bearded guy. You know, all young people wear beards nowadays. It became so trendy. And I've noticed that her leg was blue and swollen. She already had sepsis and we had to save her life. It was impossible to do in a hospital with no heating and power. And he said, your foot has to be amputated. Well, you gotta do what you gotta do, I said. And then he says, I'm taking you from here. I'll put you on a prosthetic. You'll even be able to dance. I replied, dance? Sure, I'm in. They took me to Vienna, Austria. Guess a granny found her prince, as they say. goes to our forces who are liberating towns in the east and in the south. I have a vivid memory of the day I got back to my town and saw this horror. When we arrived, a light drizzle was falling. Roads were almost gone. Everything was mutilated by their armored vehicles. The screeching of torn iron. The streets were empty. We brought two cars as we entered the village. We bought some essential supplies too. People started to come out. They looked terrible. Everyone was terrified. They looked sad. 
People came out looking so exhausted, dirty. They cried so hard. It's a tragedy, it's a horror, and God forbid it should ever happen again. Here we are at an ammunition dump full of missiles these Russian beasts used to fire at us, to shell our territory. I counted about 60 strikes. All these missiles over here, they were scattered around the farm and most of them were just stuck in the ground. For example, you'd see a couple of dead cows with a missile right in the middle. The roofs were damaged. The new office was destroyed. The hangar was destroyed. And a huge amount of equipment was burned. The equipment which was not burned or destroyed was vandalized. They shot the tires and stole the batteries. There was not a single building left that wasn't damaged at all. For about two weeks we had no idea what to do or how. But I finally came to my senses and said, Grisha, come on, man, pull yourself together, think about where to start and how. When this beast withdrew, they mined our house. We had two trip wires. Part of our farm was mined. I contacted the mayor's office to get help with clearing up the mines and an excavator to dig a pit. To comply with all sanitary standards, we buried the animals that were killed. Then we slowly started fixing the equipment, rebuilding the houses, and getting ready for the sewing campaign. My grandfather used to say, you may think about death, but you saw your bread anyway, because you have to. People were quite delighted. They believed that the fact that we came means business would be reborn. The farm will operate again and everything's gonna be fine. No matter how hard it gets, all the farmers I know are not going to give up. Everyone keeps working. Because we need to feed Ukraine. Oh, the power is down. The generator has just kicked in. In early October, Russian aggressors started attacking our nation's critical infrastructure. This caused problems with power supply. The whole farm runs on a generator, and the potato equipment uses a generator to function too. So we just keep working and wait until we win. When they say that people in Kupiansk and Izum are starving, my soul hurts. People brought things for us too. They brought some humanitarian goods here from Rivne. Now it's our turn to help. With a big heart, they ordered five tones from us, so we are gonna pack it up. You see, with our hard work, our tenacity, our kindness and our human touch, the truth is always with us. And we will win. No matter how hard they try, these bastards, we will finish them off. Putin will die anyway. We will put an end to them, and they will ask us for forgiveness. Ukraine, 
Україно, моя хлібородна, о як любимо ми Україну свою. I'm looking around, and I cannot believe it's over. What happened to us? I mean, we lived with it, and we saw it happening. Why talk about sad stuff? Let me show you some rocks. We have our own clandestine front here. These are blank rocks for this kind of design. The volunteers will take them. They will take them to a store and sell them. And they will donate some money for the army. That's our dog. It's gonna look nice. Here are some socks. Of course, I don't know how to weave. But I got my part here too. I helped to untwine the threads, sweaters, scarves. They are defending us here. And we got some warm things for them. Please, God, protect our children. grandchildren and great-grandchildren and let them live in a peaceful and rich country we have here, Ukraine. I realized I had to do something. I had to take control, because just staying in the cellar is not an option. I must do something for the young and together with the young. Because many people, just like me, don't know what to do or how to help our country, our people and our communities. We started pulling stuff from under the rubble, like some furniture that had survived. There was a large piece of art on one of the walls, with fun hub written on it. And it was covered with numerous motivational phrases. Something like, create, draw, don't be afraid, act, motivate. We disassembled it, just to discover a tiny fragment. It had dream written on it. Yeah, they destroyed our hub, but they didn't destroy our cause, our courage, our unity. They didn't destroy our Ukrainian spirit, the spirit of youth. One weekday, I just suddenly pulled people out of their beds, or wherever they were. Some people were in shelters. So I said, look, we've got two days to create a grant project and estimate the cost. It was a quick grant to restore the infrastructure destroyed during the war in Ukraine. So we won. We were so happy. It was quite an neglected place. The walls were damaged. The electrical wiring was in a terrible condition. But it didn't frighten us. We were really happy and every weekend we worked for more than eight hours a day. Everyone who came was so motivated. And here's our new youth space. You can see the beautiful artwork we created on the wall. Everyone put their special word there, associated with Ukraine. I put the word youth. 
This is just my thing, my life. Viburno, hope and eternity. Our new youth space is located in the basement, the bunker. We can always find shelter here. It's safe to say that this is the safest place of young people you could ever find today. Young people keep coming, and I see that they really appreciate having this place. We immediately began organizing meaningful leisure activities, like board game nights, movies. We do all kinds of workshops here too. Hey kids, did you know that candles are very important and very relevant nowadays? When there is no light and electricity, my sister and I always do our homework by candlelight. I do my homework by candlelight every day too. I guess every community has active and responsible young people who can restore not only youth infrastructure in their neighborhood, as we did, but even help restore nursing homes, just damaged houses of some elderly people who found themselves left outside alone. We just need to tell them that it doesn't have to be boring. It can all be done in a fun way with music, just like we did. from the village of Urajaina. It's a part of Donetsk Oblast. It's going through a lot of pain these days. My village is 10 kilometers deep on the other side of the front line. I would like to rebuild my village. I'm not doing this in my home village, but it has become my home. I never thought that I would do something like this in Chernihiv Oblast. I have absolutely no connections here. Of course, we are a heroic nation, but we don't have to hide the fact that we were attacked. We did nothing wrong. But this scum came to do us harm. They came to literally kill us. How can this ever be forgiven? For one thing, they took away my friend. He died. And you can't just fix it like this house. There is no way you can fix the dead. People may not see or hear this and may not care about children, people or friends who didn't deserve to die. Why? There is no answer to that one either. When the large-scale invasion started, I was abroad and I returned to Ukraine in June. At first, we were here on and off dismantling collapsed houses. We removed rocks to clear foundations. Then we started building brand new homes over the old foundations. I cook for guys and girls who work here. It's the only way I can thank these kind people who came here on their day off. I'm so grateful. I couldn't even hope that my house would ever be rebuilt. This lady had a pretty good household with cows and chickens. She made homemade wine. The Russians drank that wine and killed the cattle. She's got children and grandchildren, and they vandalized her house. We are building six houses here. It's being done by volunteers. Most of the people who come here don't have any experience in construction. We have a foreman to train us. And now you can already see for yourself what people can do if they are motivated. Yeah, we did it. Did we? <laughs> well, almost. I think the value of all this is not only in the fact that we are building this particular house, but that other people will see it and want to come to Kherson or Sume Oblast and build something too. You have to start somewhere. When you're building a house, you lay the first brick, then you look. They're already putting wood on the roof. And you realize it's a real person you are building for. In your life, you've been doing one thing, and next thing you know, you are a builder. I want to see the expression on Olga's face when she gets her home back. 
Yesterday she came up to me smiling and said that she hadn't felt so good for quite a while. Because you see a little more effort and the roof is ready. Just like that. It's a state of mind where every Ukrainian wants to be involved in our victory. Everyone wants to take a step and not just stay out of the fray. There will be Ukraine with its young people, wonderful people like this. And we will rebuild everything that the Russian troops destroyed in our country. And I think there will be peace one day, because war cannot last forever. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. We cannot be defeated. We are not panicking. We support each other. We are neighbors. We are one. We cannot be divided. When the war started, we were in an transit region, where people were just passing through, and just some of them stayed for some time. So we began to host a large number of displaced healthcare workers, and we made a strategic decision to have everyone with a medical degree employed. The full-scale war caught me in the city of Kharkiv at 4.50 a.m., when all territory of Ukraine was under fire. In Kharkiv, I worked at the regional cancer center. Russian shells hit the hospital. Some windows were damaged. The heating system didn't work. The hospital was down. After that, we moved to the city of Rivne. Rivne is a small and cozy city. It is much smaller compared to Kharkiv. One of Kharkiv's districts, Saltivka, is twice as large as Rivne. We have recruited some people whose expert level was good enough. And we realized that we could focus on entire segments of activities. One of them was the creation of a cardiothoracic center. Back in Kharkiv, this was the dream we had. We gave it a lot of thought to see how it might work. But the war had already begun, so we probably didn't have enough time. This center was created according to the US model where doctors can treat the heart and large vessels, lung tissue and chest cavity organs in one area. Doing this in one single place, in one department, is unique for Ukraine. You need to find a way out of any difficult situation and just keep going. You gotta keep doing what you are doing. Doctors are fighting both at the front line and in the rear. And we are that RIA that lets people at the front line do their job. The only thing we can do now is to dream of victory. Move on and fulfill the plans we had before the war. This is the largest hospital in the region. About 1,000 people attend the hospital every day. And from the first days of the war, the ultimate question was how to make it safe during wartime. We have a fairly large communication system of basements that are interconnected, probably up to a kilometer in total length. We realized that we needed to restore them. We probably took out more than 10 trucks of trash and fixed the lighting. 
we prepared the premises to deploy our surgery unit, created water supplies. We have a lot of tall buildings around our hospital. So residents used to come down to use our shelter. I guess the first challenge we faced was when we had to come downstairs ourselves, we had this feeling of anxiety. It's still there. It doesn't go away even though you realize you are in a shelter. We came up with the idea to create a space where people would not only feel safe, but also experience positive emotions, a place with a human touch. The first idea we came up with was to paint one of the walls. So we invited Konstantin Kachanovsky. He is a young and talented artist. One of his first works was The Beauty Has No Duty. The Beauty Has No Duty is a response to an aggressive statement by the Russian dictator. Like it or not, it's your duty, my beauty. You just have to do it. He said this in reference to Ukraine. I was, I was simmering with anger when I first heard that. Ukraine is depicted as a strong and independent woman. She represents our will, our resilience, meaning we will not submit. So the beauty is not going to tolerate. She will retaliate against the words of the dictator who is taking over our territories. Art inspires people. In fact, I didn't expect it to be so essential. I thought there is a war going on. People lose homes, people lose loved ones, they lose basically everything. So, what the sense in art these days? But the more I traveled around Ukraine, the more I painted, the more feedback I got from people who seemed to really need it. Given that this is a hospital, and given our current situation, I wanted to add as much color to this life as possible, just to cheer up people who would be using this shelter. Before the concert started, an air raid alert went off, and the lights in the city were down because of explosions. Our current concert season at the Philharmonic is titled Ukrainian Music as a Weapon. In fact, today we have to do our sets in shelters. And we did this concert in a complete blackout. We had to bring in all the candles and lanterns we had. But life goes on. We believe that today's air raid alert will be the last. And we want to live, love and believe. Despite the air raid alert, despite the 90 missiles fired at Ukraine, people came to see the concert. They really needed to be here and listen to Ukrainian romance songs. We will not be defeated. 
We are holding our musical line, and together we are armed forces. We are waiting and doing our best to make our Ukrainian victory happen. It is a duty for musicians to play for people. Nowadays you may even call it a cultural front. I lived in Kharkiv before the war started. I worked at the National Opera. On the morning of the 24th we woke up. They started hitting the city. It was already a real war out there. And the fighting was as close as on the outskirts of Kharkiv. It was very hard. I felt helpless, you know. I went to the recruitment office. They said, they didn't need me. I'm sorry. Almost all our company musicians left the country. Well, some of them moved to other Ukrainian cities. I have a performance schedule from a company of my fellow double bass players at the Kharkiv Opera on my phone. I don't delete it, I don't discard it. I keep it in my memory with hope and confidence. Not with hope, rather confidence that we will keep doing it. Someday, when the time comes, I will bring my grandson Mark to the Kharkiv Opera to see a children's play and he will watch it. This is how we live. We slowly calm down, but the fear is still in our hearts. Here we are at Drohobych salt factory. Our facility is one of the oldest salt factories in Ukraine and Europe. And our mine has been operating since 1473, being in the same condition you are witnessing right now. Everyone knows that there is a war raging in Donetsk Oblast, particularly in the town of Solidar. Our Tamsil enterprise was under attack. After that, Ukraine had a serious shortage of salt because the company supplied nearly entire Ukraine and even Eastern Europe. We immediately realized that we needed to increase production, that we had to provide Ukraine with salt. Our employees worked hard and doubled the output. Okay, these are called panvas. It's a special type of oven. You add firewood and there are pans on top where salt is boiled. 
See, right now we are using firewood. We don't depend on gas as well as electricity, as far as boiling salt is concerned. We only need it for drying. After we have finished boiling the salt, we pack it in bags. And then we load it on cart, which we call Fira. We used to transport salt by cars, but they last about a year before they get very corroded because of the salt. We've got lots of grass here, so the horse can graze all day. He works only for two hours. He delivers the salt and then he's free, so it's better for him too. We feel proud of what we can do. It was such an old factory, it seemed to be in decline. And then it became so important. It even started to save Ukraine. We did our best. We can do even more, but we need to use new technologies. But we need to use new technologies. Specifically, we need to replace this thousand-year-old production process with something a little bit more up-to-date. As a matter of fact, it is very important for Ukrainians to cherish what we have and preserve it for future generations. Mmm, very tasty. You don't need chips, you can just eat the salt. They made a prosthetic for me in Austria, see? I didn't want to stay in Austria, in the foreign land. So, are we going home? Yes. Home is home. Full stop. Ukraine is Ukraine. I promised that I'd dance a farewell dance for them. As soon as I got back, I went straight to my garden. I'm country woman, come on. I planted some strawberries. I'll have onions in the spring. I've got garlic over there. That's why I'm digging and planting, in case I need it in the spring and someone comes and asks, I'd like some onions or garlic. Here you go. We gotta help each other out. Let it burn. You know what they told me? You've changed a lot. It's like you're happy your leg is gone. I say I'm happy. But not because I don't have a leg. I'm happy because I'm alive. And I am alive. And I will be. When the war started, I was in the US, so I was thinking, how would I volunteer during the war? What should I do? And when I was walking through the stadium, I saw a very interesting couple, a man and a woman who approached me from a distance. I realized there was something wrong with the man. He was walking with a limp. 
cushioning his step. And when I got closer, I saw that he had two stumps above his knees and a pair of really nice prosthetics. They were very practical, and he wore shorts. It looked masculine. I said to myself, thank you, God, that's the answer. I'm going to work with the military amputees. This is the moment I like the most. Their arms are so strong when their legs don't serve them anymore. Incredible. As a rule, guys who return from the hospital for rehabilitation are thoughtful and strung up. They are shut down. Sometimes they don't even believe they are safe. Apart from prosthetics, these guys need company, understanding and social acceptance. I take them to the swimming pool to help them realize that they are what they are. They can swim better than anyone who is physically able. I want to be the support for them, like crutch they can lean on. We are back together, thank God. So happy to see you again to reunite with my family. At first it's hard. Well, you are missing a part of your body. But still someone was less lucky and you are alive. I don't have an arm. But it's inherent in everything you do, like you do really have an arm. Even when you play volleyball, you don't really notice it, but your arm is reaching out trying to hit the ball. That's great. What matters the most is that you don't lose your mind here. You hang on. You gotta live on, strive for something. We will be victorious. That's what matters the most. <laughs> okay, change the direction. <laughs> I often imagine a soldier fighting every day. Today he's wet, tomorrow he's cold. These are the trenches we live in. Next day he has nothing to eat. His comrade in arms died there and he lost hope. No matter how strong a warrior is, he's a human being. I often hear guys say to me, I can't be strong anymore. Thank you for surviving. Thank you for protecting me while I slept. I want to address all regular Ukrainian folks out there. Think about what you can do for a warrior like this. What could you offer a person who gave his body part for us? And it will return to each Ukrainian a hundredfold, no doubt about it. It's Slava. Hello, here we are. Hello, miss. How it's going? You walk so well. Okay, we brought you a warm blanket and a plaid. Look, this is the latest technology. It's an electric bed sheet. Slava, I'll show you mine. Just wait. Look, Slava. I boil some water, pour it over here, so I can sit down and watch TV. Yeah, a bed warmer. I'm so grateful to you. You're an example of resilience and energy. <laughs> you did it. You must take credit for it. 
He gave me the power to live. Slava said I'd get prosthetic and I'd dance with it. I'd like to dance with you, young man. Waltz, да? Waltz. It's just wonderful. Incredible. Who are you? Are you Ukrainian? Yeah. What about me? You are Ukrainian too. Are we going to protect our land? Yeah. Are we going to defend it from enemies? Yeah. That's right, grandson. That's right. We want a strong and independent state, but the state begins with each one of us. Just sitting around doing nothing and waiting for the government to come and make it happen doesn't work. So we've learned to start with ourselves. Those who have been under occupation know very well that we can survive. And it's not just about power cuts, it's about everyone wanting the same thing. We want Ukraine to be Ukraine and only Ukraine. It's going to get difficult. To rebuild everything, to survive everything. But we must move on. There is no other way. Our victory day is probably going to be the happiest day of my life. And I'm going to get so drunk. I just want this day to be remembered for a long, long time. Sons and daughters, don't give up. And don't give up on Ukraine, because it's ours. There is no better place than this. So we live on. And we say it's gonna be all right. Because we are Ukrainians. We will survive everything. We are strong as the earth. But